Welcome to the TGA instrument operation video. We're going to demo how to use the TGA to run two different samples today. One of them being uh, gypsum powder and the other being an unknown, which is just a uh, metal salt that's hydrated. So we can use the TGA to determine how much hydration this salt has. Um, we're going to go through a few different sections. The first is going to be sample prep, where we're going to weigh out our sample. Um, things to consider when you are uh, choosing and preparing your sample type. Um, the sample needs to fit into one of these small pans. The pans have a 100 microliter volume, and so you need to make sure that your sample will fit neatly inside the pans without spilling out. We wouldn't want the sample to be able to spill out into the furnace. The typical mass that you're going to use is between 10 and 15 milligrams. So this doesn't really require very much sample at all, which is one of its advantages. The other things to consider are how light or dense your sample is. So if your sample is really, uh, really low density, really fluffy, or something like that, then you have to worry about it being exposed to the air, the, the gas flow inside the furnace and potentially being blown off. Um, not only will that mess up your data, but if you dirty up the furnace, then we have to worry about cleaning it out before you can resume operations. You can also run liquids in this, which again, you just has to be able to fit within the volume of the pan. Um, things that you cannot run on here without special consideration are metal containing compounds. If it contains metal, we will do use a special procedure where we um, put a coating of aluminum oxide powder in the bottom of the pan to prevent the metal from alloying. Um, the second section we'll go over th is how to set up the instrument how to clean the pans, how to load the pans in the auto sampler, how to tear the pans, and then loading in your sample. And then we'll uh, intermix throughout there, and at the end we'll go over how to operate the software to use the instrument itself. Now we're going to go over massing our samples out. For this we're simply going to use an analytical balance. We have our two samples here. This is the gypsum powder. And then this one is our unknown, labeled unknown A. Um, we're simply going to use standard weigh paper. And again, we're going to weigh out between 10 and 15 milligrams. Remember that this system itself is a balance. Therefore, you don't actually need to precisely um, weigh out your, your sample mass and like record it because the balance itself will record this for you. The next step is to clean our pans off. Um, these pans are designed to go up to over a thousand degrees Celsius um, in air or an oxidizing environment. The pans, as you know, are made of a platinum alloy, so they won't react or oxidize under these conditions. Um, I'm gonna throw in a couple images, I think, because it's hard to get the camera to focus on these so closely. We clean the pans using a simple propane torch. So propane burns close to 2000 degrees Celsius in air. So therefore, if we clean it with the torch, then uh, it's very unlikely that any, any contaminants will affect our run. Um, visibly, the pans do not come fully clean because of, of use and, and stuff that's end up permanently adhered to them. 
but we do know they are clean. We've tested this. We've torched really dirty looking pans and ran them and they have lost almost no mass. Um, we make sure we use the really long tweezers when we're torching the pan so that the heat doesn't creep up and burn us as it will with the small tweezers. Um, remember that the uh, tweezers are, are just steel and they will stay hot for quite a long time, which is why when we set them down after we're done, we put them in such a way that we're not gonna accidentally bump the hot end of it. Um, we do use the long tweezers for this, but for any manipulation of the pans, such as placing them in the auto sampler or just moving them around, we're gonna use the small tweezers. Um, one of the biggest problems we have with the pans is people accidentally bending them and then the auto sampler cannot pick them up. So in the images that I'm gonna attach, you'll see that the pans are not uh, very straight, the wires are not very straight. Um, but right for now, we're just going to go over cleaning these two pans. Uh, we're going to make sure we grab them by the side of the pan, not the actual pan or the tip. The tip is where the wire, the, the little wire hook actually grabs the pan, so we don't want to mess that up. You want to torch them for a good five seconds or so, making sure that they get red hot. Um, you obviously want to torch it in such a way that you're not going to accidentally burn anything nearby or anyone. Um, try and get this in the shot nicely. So we make sure that we hit all sides of the pan. If you see stuff burning off, make sure you go like five more seconds past that. The pan cools down very rapidly. It's probably nearly at room temperature by now, so we can set that down. But remember that the tweezers will remain quite hot. Torch the second pan. On the video, it looks more like a, a bright white glow, but in reality, it's a, it's like a, a fiery orange, like coals in a fire glow that you're actually seeing when you torch these pans. So again, we're gonna be safe with the tweezers and put them in such a way we won't accidentally bump them. The next step is to load the empty pans into the auto sampler, and then we will tear them uh, we're going to tear them using the instrument because the instrument needs to know the mass of the empty pan in order to calculate the mass of your sample. Um, I'm going to insert an image here as well because, again, it's hard to see. The two, the, the one wire, the two ends of the wire that, that form the little house-shaped top of the pan, uh, they're welded onto the bottom of the pan. Um, and then to load the pans into the auto sampler, you need to line the wire up with the little slots that are in the auto sampler. So tearing the pans takes about three-ish minutes per pan. So we are going to get that going sooner than later. If you were the one running it, you'd wanna probably torch your pans first and while they're tearing, then you could go weigh stuff out. This is going to be a little bit out of order, but the first thing I'm going to show you in this software is how to tear the pans so that we can get that going. And then we can start talking about uh, the other parts of the software. So you can calibrate it a couple different, or tear the pans a couple different ways. There's the tear button here, or you can go to calibrate and hit tear or control T. Um, and then the tear window pops up. We're going to move it off to the side. And then we're going to choose pans one and two, and then click tear. You'll see that the instrument is now rotating, and it's going to attempt to pick up the pan. If one of the wires on the pans is bent enough that it can't be grabbed, this is your time to figure that out and choose a different pan.
the next step here is to load up our samples into the pans. I know it seems silly, but I want to remind you that once the pans have been teared to their respective positions, they need to remain those pans. So pan one needs to remain pan one as the mass was recorded in that location. Um, the a helpful thing here is to add in uh, is to use some weigh paper to ensure that if you spill, you can recover your sample. So for pan one, um, we've creased the paper here to help us funnel it. And so for pan one, we're simply going to use this to uh, get our sample deposited. Um, now we'll go over the software a bit. So we can leave the uh, the tearing window up while we go over the software. So on the left side of the software, we have our sequence of runs. So right now there are two runs. Um, initially, they both had this red check mark here, which indicated that the runs had been completed. If it has a check mark there, it will not attempt to run those at all because it already thinks that they've been finished. Um, the easiest thing to do when you first open this is to hit this page button, blank page, which will give you a, a new sequence, and it'll reset it. If you want to manually reset the uh, run, you can just click on the check mark and it'll go away, which will allow the run to proceed. So I'm going to click the, the new sequence page, the blank page button, and it's just going to erase it down to one run. Um, no matter how many runs are on there, it will always just bring it down to one run. Um, this little red arrow to the left indicates which run is going to start. If that red arrow does not show up, you need to just manually click here and put it there. For each run, this center section is unique, so it has three tabs, the Summary, Procedure, and Notes tab. In the Summary tab, you get a summary of the run. So you get a summary of the procedure, saying that this is the TGA, and we're doing a ramp test. Um, there are other test types that you can do. Mainly, people use a ramp 98% of the time or something. Um, we're going to put in our sample name. So our first sample is going to be gypsum. The pan type is always platinum. That's the types of pans we have. Um, and then our gypsum, we're going to put in the pan 1. So I'm going to change that there. And then down here is our save location. It's easy to miss because it's the same gray as everything else. So we'll hit the browse button here. Uh, an important thing to note is that the way they wrote their software, so the, the brand of the instrument is TA Instruments. So they have a TA folder on the C drive, and there's a data folder within that. You must always save your data within the TA folder. The software does not have permission to write to any other location. It's a weird quirk, but once the data has been written by the software, you can copy it to wherever you want. Um, we're going to just save this into class, and I'm going to just create a folder for this specific run, because this is a demo that doesn't exactly fit within a specific class. This is also where we add our file name. Our file name can be separate from our sample name. Um, in this case, it makes sense for it to be the same. The file extension is a generic data file. It's a dot number, 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 so three-digit number. If you just hit open, it'll automatically assign an appropriate data file extension. Um, it'll never overwrite data if you happen to give it the same file name, unless you use more than 1,000 of the same file name, which is very unlikely, because you can go from dot zero 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 to dot nine nine nine. So we'll hit open here. And that means that we have now saved it to the data folder in classes and then in the AMSEC folder I just made. You can kind of highlight and drag to the right to see the full path and file name. So we named it gypsum.001. Now we're going to move on to the procedure tab. So in the procedure tab, you choose your test type. 
So we can do a ramp, um, a heat and hold, which just ramps to a temperature and holds it for a set amount of time. And then stepwise isothermal, this is a rarely used test by us, but it um, increments by a certain amount of, uh, a certain set of uh, degrees. So you say, I want to go up to 1,000 in an increment of 100 and for 5 minutes. So it'll go up to 100, hold for 5 minutes, go up to 200, hold for 5 minutes, etc., until it reaches 1,000, at which it'll hold for 5 minutes and end the run. Um, so we're just going to do a simple ramp. Uh, heating rates we use are typically uh, 5, 10, or 20 degrees C per minute. 10 or 20 are more common. We start with 20, and if we need to try and uh, separate out some transitions, then we might redo the run and drop it to 10 C a minute. For this run, we're going to choose a final temperature of 600, just because from experience we know that um, nothing is going to happen above 600. Um, anytime you make a change to the uh, run, the left side will gray out, and that indicates that you need to apply or cancel your changes to that run. So if you accidentally edited something, you could just cancel here. Um, an important thing, so I'm going to apply that, sorry. Um, an important thing to note is that by default, the uh, furnace is always run with nitrogen purging through it. You could switch to air, at which you would do that with this toggle. Um, you could hook up many different types of gases, so generically they just call it gas 2, which we have air hooked into. And you would tell it at which temperature you want to switch to air. So if you want to run in air the whole time, you could tell it like 20 C. Um, if you want to do a common test called loss and ignition, you would do it at 600 C. So you would ramp to 1,000 going up to 600 nitrogen and continuing in air. This gives you um, this gives you carbon content, which is what's left at 600. When it switches to air, the carbon will burn off. And then at the end, you can get your inert content. Um, we're just going to run a nitrogen because our stuff uh, doesn't need air uh, to, to fully um, lose all the mass. And then an important thing is under the post-test button is that we need to have the air cool enabled for 15 minutes. So when the furnace is done with a run, it's still going to be quite hot, and it doesn't have any active cooling, uh, but it'll purge air through the furnace, uh, which will cool it down to room temperature. The important thing to note is that the furnace does not care. Or the system does not care what the temperature is of the furnace. If you had air cool turned off, it would simply drop the furnace at 600 degrees, unload your sample, load the next one, and just begin the second run. So it's very important that you always have the air cool enabled so that it can get down to room temperature before the second run or subsequent rounds. Um, in the notes tab, we just have a spot where we can put our operator. So I'm just going to put my initials. It is possible to switch to air in this fashion, but that is not recommended because that's not how we teach people to do it, and therefore um, you'll mess people up. This will this setting persists, so if, if you switch it to air here, then the next people will automatically be running in air even if they don't want to, if they happen to not check this. The flow rates for the balance and sample are, are fixed, and it's calibrated at those flow rates, and if you change them, the calibrations will not be accurate. So avoid messing with those. Um, so that's it for one run. We're going to apply our changes. For the second run, we simply um, hit append, which will apply. Uh, it'll literally copy whatever run you have selected. In this case, we only have one run. So it will copy that run. Um, everything except for the pan number is automatically incremented up to pan number two. So right now we are on run two. We're going to change this to unknown A. Um, pan 2 is correct, and then we're going to hit the browse button and change our file name to unknown A. Hit open, and now we can confirm that it is in fact changed. We're going to use the same procedure, so it's handy that it copied it for us, and the notes are all the same too. So that's how we set up the um, that's how we set up the software here. 
a couple things to note here are that if the uh, run fails for whatever reason, usually you'll get an error that pops up. But you also have a check mark that has an X through it, um, and that indicates that the run has failed. You can go up to View and hit the Instrument Log, and it'll change the view to show you what has been happening. And you could determine maybe if a pan failed, uh, a pan tear failed, or something like that. Uh, it would also give you what error had popped up if you happen to not be here when the error popped up for a failed run or some other possible error. Um, so, look, pan 2 just finished tearing. It gives you the uh, mass of the pan, at least according to the instrument. It's all relative because. Uh, because it can technically have a negative mass even though that doesn't exist. It's just the position of the balance. So that's all it needs to know. Um, we're going to hit close at the bottom right and we'll get out of the instrument log. Now that uh, we've loaded up our pans, so we weighed our sample, cleaned our pans, teared our pans, and loaded them with sample. Um, we've also set up our two different runs in the software. You can imagine that we would just keep it runs up to our maximum of 16 that the auto sampler can hold. Um, we're ready to start our run, so we're going to hit play up here. It's going to start the run. If at any time we need to stop it, we just hit the stop red stop button here. We're going to do a time lapse now. This run takes about a half an hour, um, not including air cooling. Air cooling is an additional 15 minutes. But we'll record the whole thing and do a time lapse so we can see what that looks like. So we're not going to show, but the pan's going to load up. You've seen this a couple times already. Um, it's going to load up the furnace. It's going to rise up the seal, and then it's going to begin heating. Thanks for watching. Feel free to email me any questions at the email on the screen.